Hey there, and welcome to Work Dope, a podcast on the messiness and the potential of humans at work. I'm Linda Stacy, and I'm a corporate sellout who likes to think of herself now as a corporate innovator. And I think that working in corporate America doesn't have to suck, even though it often does. By some statistics, up to 80% of the workforce is dissatisfied, unsatisfied, not engaged at work. And of course, more and more, we're expecting more and more out of work. We're expecting it to fill our needs for satisfaction, for being valued, for creating our identity. You know, where's the, uh, where's the coming together in all of this? And with the pandemic and the great resignation, all of this has forced us to take a look at the quality of life and what culture really means right inside of companies and for people within organizations. I do always like to say that I think business and organizations and corporate, I think it's all cool. I think that building things and solving real world problems, um, it's a fantastic way for humans to create and to move forward. But of course, it's also ripe for problems. In this episode, I'm talking about self-esteem. This is a solo episode. Um, Everyone experiences waves, um, ups and downs, or on and off, basically, with self-esteem. Sometimes we're feeling, you know, more than, sometimes we're feeling lesser than. All of this is part of the human experience, and it often shows up and messes us up at work, you know, whether it's just us dealing with our own levels of, um, you know, abilities, but also how we interact with other people and how other people are interacting with us. You know, what can we do? How can we mitigate? How can we free up some energy within all of this? in order to have more satisfaction, more freedom, more fun in the work that you do with your coworkers, with your clients and customers. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey there and welcome. Today's episode is a solo episode where I'm going to be talking about concepts around better than and less than mentality and how this shows up at work. Is it inherent that in an organization that has hierarchy that some are going to just be seen as better than and others as less than? Does this have to be? Is it a default for organizations? Do we have to buy into it? I don't think so. And this might just be the beginning of this conversation, but I want to get into some aspects. And it kind of came up a little bit from something we talked about last time with Jerry and Christy. Christy had brought up the idea of self-esteem being the root cause of most difficulties between human beings. And this is directly linked to this, um, whether we go up or we go down, whether we feel superior or whether we feel inferior. So I thought I'd get into this a little bit. Um, I've been thinking about this for such a long time. I want to set the stage with some stories, um, you know, set a little bit of context here. But I wonder if you've had this type of experience too, or you did back in school. When I remember being in the sixth grade, uh, I was in a small Catholic school in Southern California, and I was highly aware of what the eighth graders were up to, right? Like everyone that was above me in grade, I was very, very fascinated by. I knew everyone's name. I wanted to know all of the gossip, everything that was going on in that class. And I'd always have a crush on at least one boy, right? Just very, very curious about what was going on with these upperclassmen, you know, if you will. And then I noticed that, you know, when I got into eighth grade, I had very little awareness of what the sixth graders were up to. I didn't know any of their names. I didn't really have any curiosity. And I probably made assumptions. I made assumptions that none of them had anything to offer me in terms of connection or good times or whatever one is seeking in the eighth grade. And this probably had something to do with status. I think that a lot of us in middle school and high school are worried about where we're going to fit in in the social strata of our environment. And even for many of us, this continues into adulthood. You know, where do we fit? We're constantly grading ourselves consciously and subconsciously based on our environment. And sometimes, you know, when this is subconscious, we might leave an event, a party, we might even have an experience in a city, a brand new city, someplace where we're not, you know, in our normal, natural, whatever environment, and we either feel drained or we feel exhilarated. And sometimes it might be these things that are coming in from whether or not we felt that we could be in a better than or a less than type of space. So I've noticed this is a thing in corporate too. You know, we seem much more interested in the lives of those, quote unquote, above us than those below us. We might compare ourselves um, to the potential experience of those above. You know, we might actually do this very, very consciously. One small thing that happened during the pandemic that I noticed is that some coworkers were making comments about how nice the home offices were of 
of, you know, executives now that we're all working from home and we didn't have like corporate backgrounds yet in our Zoom and our Teams call. So, you know, we're noticing these differences. So are we noticing these differences in home environment just as differences or do we go to a less than or better than mentality? Ultimately, those executives are not inherently better or less than any of us. Yes, their physical environment might seem more posh, but is that a reflection of a better human being? And I'm going to be talking about what it means to have value as a human being in just a minute and how it's separate from these types of differences. We might even be taking for granted the experience of those below us. This is more subconscious. We make assumptions. We might bemoan our paltry raise or something like that, or some effect of something that happened in our work environment. But we don't even think about perhaps the custodial staff who's coming in and seeing us every day, witnessing us in our seemingly more posh environment where we get to sit at our desks in one air conditioned space all day, enjoying free beverages and potentially an occasional free lunch and that type of thing. And we might not be noticing that. Some of us are. Some of us might not be just kind of noticing these differences that exist. And are we able to appreciate the things that we have that are kind of nice and cool and special and in some cases even privileged? And then, you know, I remember watching Mad Men we watched the entire episode I'm pretty much during the, I'm sorry, the entire series during the pandemic. So somewhat more fresh in my mind, but there was a scene in an elevator. You might recall if you watched this series and the copywriter, he's very animated. It came in in some of the later seasons. His name was Michael Ginsburg in the show. He was getting into the elevator with Don Draper and he kind of rushed to get in there because he wanted to confront Don on something. And Don is, you know, the main character of Mad Men. And <laughs> they, towards the end of this confronting behavior where Don just is like dripping with like disdain for this subordinate, <laughs> the subordinate says, I feel bad for you. And then Don says, I don't think about you at all. And again, just like dripping with contempt for this person. And of course, this is, you know, a fictional story, right? But all of this, usually fiction, is made to reflect the experience that we uh, have in the world. And movies and entertainment are really designed to speak to our greatest hopes and desires and also to our greatest fears. This is really a reflection of one of these big fears of just not mattering to this person that we've put on a pedestal. And even though we might consider them a jerk in many regards or an arrogant and all these things, but at the same time, we want so much their approval, right? <laughs> the contempt that was dripping from Don is likely a reflection of something that the subordinate has made up, right? Sometimes. I, I have to say, too, that I had an experience when I was waiting tables in college where someone from the kitchen staff was moving jam, I remember distinctly, from one area to another. And it was very, very liquidy. We made it in-house. And the owner of the restaurant was back there in the kitchen at the same time. And, and he was an owner who, gosh, I need to find compassion in my heart for this man. But he would just kind of like stand around and observe. And it, to me, felt like he was looking for things to go wrong. And this kitchen staff person dropped one of the containers in front of him and the jam because it was so liquidy just like spilled onto the floor and I wanted to help this guy so badly what a humiliating experience and you know to have to now clean it up so I'm running to get rags you know dish towels whatever things to help to help him clean it up and the owner is just looking at me and him with disdain and he says he says Linda don't help him you know and i was just like oh my god you know what a dick and and like this poor <laughs> human being who just dropped this thing in front of this man who's seen as, you know, the the rich one that owns the restaurant and is making his life miserable. It was just so like textbook storybook. I also had an experience of, you know, I, I've I wrote a book a few years ago and someone from my regular job had moved on to a company where I have a friend working and my friend told this person about the book and his response was, you know, was it, was it like a real book? And 
I don't think she really probed to ask what he meant by that. She kind of got his meaning, but it was like, does that mean, you know, it was it picked up by a real publisher? Was it self-published? Like, what are the things about that? And like, what was the need to kind of put this into a less than type of, you know, hierarchy or something like that? And a last story or a little excerpt that I recall that kind of exemplifies this type of thing. When I was in college, uh, my second year, I moved on into a dorm on campus with someone who had been in a room with me from my freshman year, and we were off campus, and we were making new friends and such. And one of the people that my friend, my roommate made friends with, I, I didn't trust. I just had the sense that she was really capable of hurting me. She would joke sometimes and there would be like microaggressions dropped in. And so I started to kind of hold back and I know I was very withdrawn when I was around them. And plus she and my roommate were spending more and more time just exclusively. I felt like I was kind of being, you know, backburnered or something. I wasn't as appreciated anymore. But again, my fear made me distance and not extend myself as much to this person. But one afternoon she came to our door and I had been sleeping. And in order to kind of overcompensate for probably just being very, very groggy, I opened the door with this huge smile on my face. And her reaction to me was incredibly warm and accommodating. And it was like, it was really remarkable to me how my expression changed her expression. My come from changed the way that she interacted with me. There was a lot of lesson in that for me. You know, what stories were we making up about each other, right? How threatened was she of me? Like the same way I was feeling threatened by her taking my roommate's friendship from me in some way. And how helpful was it for her to see an opening in me instead of me being closed? And maybe there was a possibility of connection, right? Overall, for me, I learned the power of being the change in that moment. And it sounds so like Pollyanna and, ugh, I mean, back in the day, back to the Catholic school, third grade, you know, we would do the... Uh, let peace begin with me song. And it made sense to me then. It made like intuitive sense. And I think it makes sense today in corporate that yes, there are still these better than less than things happening all the time. And it can come off in weird microaggressive ways. But if we're willing to put out that which we wish to receive, I think we're going to get more of what we want to see and what we want to experience. All of this is getting back to the idea of self-esteem and what it is. As I mentioned in the last episode, Christy mentioned that all relationships problems pretty much are based in this, you know, in, in esteem issues and having a one up or one down type of mentality and having one up, one down, you know, it leads to feeling worthless or feeling better than, and it doesn't really lend itself to healthy relationship. And I'd like to think that we can be working towards healthy relationship, whether we're at work or and we're in a primary relationship or with our families or whatever that is. So since then, and I talked to Jerry and Christy almost two weeks ago now, I've been looking a lot at the work that they've studied in their, uh, their lives and the work of Terry Real and Pia Melody and other concepts that I've known for a while because of other things that I've studied. And, you know, we, we all come into this world as valuable human beings. We're little babies full of potential, full of potential. And of course, at the same time, we're at the mercy of the environment in which we land. We all come with weaknesses and we all come with strengths. And weaknesses are really there. They're meant to help us learn and grow. So when we look at the differences in other people, we look different, we think differently, we have different levels of intelligence, we dress differently, we express ourselves, we're all different. And to the extent that we can observe these differences, we're so much better off than if we're using them as a way to compare. Differences do not affect our self-worth, but we let them affect our self-worth. Like when the coworker comments about the executive's office. I'm not saying that that person really was having a self-worth issue, but the comment was kind of indicative of, you know, mine isn't as good as that. 
can we look at it and observe how beautiful that environment is? Wow, what a beautiful painting on the wall. Look at how nice that trim molding is or something like that. I think it's possible to observe and to appreciate without feeling less than. And I, I think that it's a very human thing to go to this less than mentality. So when we see the differences, really the shift here is to understand what we're meant to learn or how can we get curious? How can we appreciate something remarkable just in the way something is set up? Even to notice something and say, wow, how cool would it be if I could bring a little bit of that into my own space? The real danger here is that we use the differences to go to a less than or a better than type of mentality. Achievement, beauty, money, social position, all of these things have nothing to do with our inherent self-worth. They are just differences. We all have a sense of value and, and in order to have it and maintain it and know our sense of value, we need to be paying attention to it. We need to be paying attention to it. I continue to come back to this idea of what it means to be valued in the workplace, what it means to matter in the workplace. We need to be able to recognize what it is and appreciate about ourselves what those characteristics are. And we need to bring them forward. And we need to have our behaviors reflect that we matter. Are you doing the things that reflect that you matter? As I was watching some of Pia Melody's really old videos on some of these concepts, she was talking about how she knows that in the summertime and where she was living in Arizona, that if she if she's had a long day and she goes to bed feeling quite sticky, you know, she she doesn't sleep very well, right? And so she'd had a very long day and she was coming into the next day at, that, that was also going to be kind of a long and important day. She's just exhausted. All she wanted to do is throw herself into bed. And she did initially. But then she got the better of herself. And she said, you know, I know that I do much better if I've kind of cleaned up. So she took a short bath and went back to bed. And this is taking the action, doing the behavior that indicates to the world and to yourself that you matter. And this is what builds the self-esteem and therefore keeps you from being reliant on people in your work environment that might not be able to, to, to give it to you or to demonstrate it to you maybe in the way that you hope that they could. It's, it's, it's on us to reflect our value back to the world from the behavior that we are, are putting forth. Being caught up in this less than, better than mentality, it can be incredibly draining. I know I've lived it for so long. It can keep us from real joy and connection and play and even pleasure in one's work. And sometimes we're not even aware that we're doing this to ourselves. So again, back to being valued and mattering in your work environment. This is one of the main topics behind, you know, Living Blueprints, the, the business that has led to this podcast. And it really struck a nerve. I know I did a video a few years ago on YouTube about this and, and you know, this idea of mattering. And the truth is that you as a human have value by default and that your behavior is best going to reflect your mattering in the world. Another concept that Pia put forth in one of her videos was that self-esteem, it's, it's not a, an issue of increasing or decreasing one's self-esteem. She describes it as you're either in it or you're not in it. So from moment to moment, you're either valuing yourself or you're not valuing yourself. It's also important to note, as she does, and she refers to another author, and as she's talking about this, that occasionally feeling uncertain about your value is completely normal. That's the part of us being human beings. And so we're going to feel occasionally uncertain about our value. And I think this is where it gets complicated in the workplace because, you know, I hear people so often that they want to be valued in the workplace but you know we're relying on employers to understand and and to compensate for for just what is humanity it's our humanity to question our value and to be in and out of the self esteem is a totally normal fluctuation the good news is that we can get better at being aware and having it at being in good self-esteem, it being in the mentality of I have value. Again, we're all going to fluctuate on this, but we can get better at noticing and recognizing. We can learn to appreciate things in our environment. We can look to continue to do the things that indicate to the world that we matter. Noticing a mistake, you know, you're noticing it because you're human. 
having warm regard for yourself with your flaws there, you know, we are perfectly imperfect, that is self-esteem. So again, your own behavior is going to reflect your mattering. And this is really, it's interesting that it's come full circle with this and what Living Blueprints initially was set, setting out to do with productivity and getting your, you know, your kind of your shit together, your life in order. And how are you going to create disciplines and practices that reinforce that you matter? A lot of this I've talked about so many times before, you know, are you doing some kind of preview at the beginning of your week? Are you getting yourself set up for success? Are you, you know, having your, your clothes ready, your physical environment ready? Are you bio ready? Are you having meals that make you feel good in your environment ready for you? Are you taking care of yourself? The third episode that I did, um, it was published on May 16th, 2022, how to keep your shit together at work from avoiding hangry to managing procrastination. You've got this, had a bunch of tips in it, but also my book Optimized You covers nine different ways to kind of stay on top of things in a very distracted world. If you want a copy of that book, I will send you an e-copy. It's also on Amazon, but if you want it, email me, Linda at workdopepod.com, Linda at workdopepod.com, and I will send you a copy of my book, Optimized You. You know, have you taken some time in your own head space at the beginning of a day? Have you taken some time for whatever it is, a short walk, um, just, just previewing? Think, how do you want your day to unfold? You know, are you going to be passive about it? Are you going to let kind of whatever whims of, you know, the email gods throw at you? Or are you going to be intentional about how you organize and respond to things and the different projects that you have going on and create mini roadmaps for yourself for the day? Even, and be conscious of the fact that, yeah, it's probably going to get sidetracked by other things that come up, but that's what makes me value in my organization. You know, some automated AI thing isn't going to be able to navigate the fact that, you know, oops, there was a change or oops, there was a last minute meeting. That's the nature of business. How are you going to mentally prepare for that? And interrelationally, how are you going to lead with the values that you want to see in the world? What are the values that you want to see in the world? So much of what I've read about and Terry Reel's work really was around that so much of the population is living in a passive, in a passive way. And I, I get it. I mean, I default to that. That has been my life for so long. I, you know, I, it's just kind of the environment that I grew up in that kind of life happens to you, right? Until you learn that it doesn't have to. And that yes, there are things that are out of your control, but we always have the, you know, the things that we do control, which are our actions, our reactions, and our mindset. And so much of that is here and rooted in self-esteem and knowing that you matter and that you can exude what you want, the values that you want to see and the values that you expect to receive. In every exchange that you have with other people, you can be doing this. And it's not always going to go beautifully. Sometimes people are going to come at you with other shit that's going on. And that may or may not have something to do with you directly. How are you going to be calm and you know, continue to be who you want to be in the midst of the craziness. You know, it's it's easy to be, you know, simpatico with others who are kind of doing exactly the same thing that you're doing and, and, and understand you and see you and value you and talk to the way that you want to be talked to. But really, you know, the rubber hits the road when you can maintain that, be grounded in the face of the challenge. And this is a this is a daily thing. This is a daily thing for me. I mean, I I want to choose to you know walk in compassion, as Jerry said in the last episode. That you know choosing to be in the world as a compassionate human is a spiritual practice. And I don't subscribe to any you know written religion in any way, but I. I do want to be this in the world and I've got a long way to go and I know that I have, I can easily lean into the uh, one up and less than mentality and I work, I work the best that I can to stay in non-judgment and I know that I've made some improvement, but I know that I fall back on it on occasion too. And when I see it happen in other people, when I see them leaning on judgment or I see them defaulting to less than mentality, I want to go in and kind of like save them or correct them in the moment. And I realize that that's part of my thing too. That's part of my need to control or my need to make things better. So with the podcast and, and the information and the conversations that I'm having here, my intention really is to raise awareness and to give tools that 
ultimately lean towards more freedom, more joy, less energy drain in the lives that we're here to live and a little bit more room and space for growth. And that's going to equal different things for different people. And I'm going to guess that the people who want to lean in that way will resonate with what I'm saying. And those who prefer, or, you know, who are going to be in a more more comfortable, maybe in a passive state, um, will maybe reject the content here. If you want any of the tips and tools that I've created in terms of getting yourself set up, you know, go back to that third episode. And also you can have my book, Optimized You. Email me, Linda at workdopepod.com. Until next time, have a great week. There you have it. This episode is in the books. I mentioned two main figures in this episode. One is Terry Real and the other is Pia Melody. So Terry Real, the two books that I've touched upon, actually one I've read completely and the other I've just been browsing a bit. The most recent is called Us, Getting Past You and Me to Build a More Loving Relationship. And then the other older one is The New Rules of Marriage. And then with Pia Melody, her most recent book is Facing Codependence. So she's one of the you know forefront forerunners for codependence, and really a lot of her material online begins in the 80s. So the most recent book, Facing Codependence, what it is, where it comes from, and how it sabotages our lives, just came out in June, actually. Um, Terry's books are really focused on couples and partnered relationships, and Pia's are more about looking at your own behavior, how it developed, um, how it may or may not be helping you get what you want out of life, basically. And both of them have applications for what happens at work because we're constantly relating with people, sometimes more intensely than we are with our partners, right? These people that we work with for hours and hours every week. I also mentioned the offer for my book, an e-copy of it, Optimized You, Nine Tips for Dealing in an Overwhelming, you know, Constantly Distracted World. If you would like a copy, you can email me at lynda at workdopepod.com. Just ask for it. It's lynda at workdopepod, so W-O-R-K-D-O-P-E-P-O-D.com. And of course, if you want to send me any messages or notes about anything that occurs to you, uh, comments, reactions, if you have crazy stories of things that have happened to you at work, just totally like egregious out there BS type things, and you wish you had a better way to navigate, that kind of might be cool for us to chat about here in the episode, whether you're on or not with us. Um, and until next time, this is Linda Stacy signing off for Work Dope. Bye-bye.